Let's create an eight ball pool game in 3D with realistic physics using JavaScript. Today, we're coding using the free online editor at editor.p5js.org. The first thing we need to do is turn on WebGL mode since we want to render our balls in 3D. To make life simpler, I'm going to set the origin to the top left. Otherwise, we're stuck having 0, 0 in the center of the screen. We're going to be using Matter.js to calculate all of the physics, so I need to import it by adding a new JavaScript tag in my index.html. I'll simply click on the index.html file in the left sidebar and add the Matter.js JavaScript code snippet. You can find the latest code snippet by searching for the Matter.js website and then clicking on Getting Started. Next, I want to draw the table. I've made a pixel art image of a pool table using stable diffusion, as well as textures for each of the balls. I've uploaded these into the images directory. Here are the images. They're not perfect, but I think they're a great start for this project. You might want to experiment with customizing these images. Let's preload all of these textures now and render the table image. I'm not gonna go over this in detail since you've already seen me do this a few times in previous videos. Oops, since we're using WebGL, I forgot I need to set image mode to center. That's better. Let's start by creating some global variables. We'll need one for our Matter.js physics engine. I'll also need to keep track of the cue ball, as well as all of the balls on the table, including the cue ball. I'll create a drag start variable, which will measure the user's mouse when they're trying to hit the cue ball. I'll also define the ball radius as 12 pixels and the cue ball's starting X position. I'll define the pocket radius to be 3.5 times the ball radius, and I want the table's rims to be 40 pixels. This will all make more sense when we start creating the layout of the table in more detail. We're also going to have a debug mode so we can see some hidden structures, but let's set this initially to false. All right, let's now define our table object. I've calculated its left, top, right, and bottom coordinates by manually measuring the background image. I'll create empty arrays for the boundaries of the table and the pockets. I'll also make myself some convenience functions so that I can easily calculate the width, height, and center Y line of the table. Before we go any further, I'll initialize Matter.js, our 2D physics engine, inside the setup function. To keep things efficient, we're going to track everything in 2D and then render in 3D. We don't need any gravity on the Y axis, so I'll set that to zero. Once it's configured, we can run the engine. With the engine defined, let's create a boundary class. In other words, a side of our table, or a cushion, if you really wanted to get technical. It will have an X and Y position, as well as a width and a height. I also need to calculate the center point coordinate, since Matter.js uses that, rather than the top left point as an anchor. We can now create the boundary as a static Matter.js rectangle, and add it to our world inside our physics engine. Now we can define all four table boundaries inside an array. This is the top, bottom, left, and right boundaries in that order. Pause the video and take a look at what I've done here if this is confusing you. Inside setup, we'll just need to call this method. Next, let's create the debug mode so we can see these boundaries. I'll implement the key pressed function and toggle the debug mode variable when the user presses the D key. I'll then create a new function called maybe draw debug. If we're not in debug mode, I'll simply return early. Otherwise, let's draw each boundary with a cyan outline and a magenta fill with a certain amount of transparency, or alpha, so we can see the image underneath. You'll remember from my last video that we use push and pop to keep all of the drawing settings inside a nice little block. Now we can call this method inside our draw function. Let's take a look. Cool, let's work on the pockets now. I'll create a new method on our table object with all of the pocket locations. Again, I measured these manually and adjusted them a few times using debug mode. I'll draw each pocket as a yellow ellipse inside debug mode. I'll need to loop through all of the pockets and calculate the radius of the pocket based on the ball radius and the pocket to ball ratio variable we defined earlier. I'll also need to remember to call init pockets inside our setup function. You'll notice that only a tiny portion of each pocket extends onto the table. If a ball hits this small area, we'll assume it would have rolled into the pocket. More on this later. With our table all set up, 
we're now ready to start the fun stuff. Implementing the balls. Let's create a ball class. The constructor will accept an initial X and Y position, as well as the name of the ball. For example, Q for the Q ball, or ball one for ball number one. For the physics engine, we'll create each ball as a 2D circle, set values for restitution, friction, and density. Again, I experimented with different values until I found ones I liked. Once created, we need to add the ball to our Matter.js world. I'm going to quickly create some convenience functions so that I can easily get and set a ball's X and Y position and velocity, rather than typing these out in full each time. These are mainly calling the Matter.js API. Now we can write a display method to render the ball as a 3D sphere for WebGL. We'll use the correct texture for the ball based on the ball's name. Let's now create a new function called RackBalls that will position all the balls correctly. For now, let's just create the cue ball. To see the cue ball on the table, we'll need to call RackBalls inside our setup function and then call display on each ball inside our draw function. Great. Let's now rack all the object balls into the starting triangle. Inside of the rack balls function, I'll define the ball order, starting with ball number nine and ending with ball number five. Then I need to loop so that we have five rows, starting with a row length of one at the apex of the triangle, all the way to a row length of five on row number five at the base. We'll define the foot spots X coordinate as 290, which will be the very apex of our triangle. Then let's set the ball spacing to two times ball radius plus three pixels, ensuring they are close but not touching. We'll calculate the X offset as the square root of three times ball radius, a calculation based on equilateral triangles. We'll also initialize the variable I to zero to keep track of the current ball being positioned. We can now select a ball to rack, calculate its X and Y position, and then push a new ball object onto our balls array, incrementing I at the end. Let's take a look to see if it worked. You beauty, okay, let's now work on making the game interactive. Remember the drag start variable we defined at the top of the file? Let's put that to good use by allowing the user to shoot the cue ball. We'll add a new function called mouse pressed. We'll check if the cue ball exists first. If not, we'll just return early. If we're close to the cue ball, i.e. if our mouse distance from the cue ball is less than double the ball's radius, then we'll set drag start to the current mouse position. When the user releases the mouse, if drag start is null, we'll just return early. Otherwise, we calculate a force vector by subtracting the mouse's release position from the drag start position. And then we scale this down by 90% so that it's more realistic. Finally, we apply the force as a velocity to our cue ball and reset drag start to null. Let's try it out. That's good, but I want to see something visual to know what's happening. Let's fix that. Let's add a function called draw cue line. Inside, we'll draw a cyan colored four pixel wide line from the cue ball's position to the current mouse position. Inside the draw function, we'll call draw cue line if drag start isn't null. Much better. However, the balls aren't rotating naturally. Let's fix that. Up in the ball class, I'm going to add two new variables, rotation axis and rotation angle, and I'll pass these values to the rotation method when we're drawing the ball. We'll only modify a ball's rotation if it has significant movement, checking if the magnitude of its velocity is greater than 0.1. If this condition is met, we rotate the ball perpendicular to its velocity, ensuring the rotation reflects the ball's actual motion. Then, we increment the ball's rotation angle based on the distance it has traveled, which mimics the effect of a rolling ball. That looks awesome! Okay, we're almost done. The final thing we need to do is remove balls if they are pocketed. Up in our table object, I'm going to create a new function called check pockets and loop through all of the balls so that we can check them one by one. Like always, because we may remove balls from our balls array inside the loop, I need to loop backwards so that we don't have any weirdness when an item is removed. For every ball, we'll loop through all the pockets and calculate the distance between the ball and each pocket using the P5 distance function. 
If the distance is less than the ball radius times the pocket to ball ratio, we have a ball close enough to be considered in a pocket. If it's the cue ball, we reset it by calling reset cue ball. For other balls, we remove them from the Matter.js world and also remove them from the balls array to keep our game state accurate. The final thing we need to do is implement the reset cue ball function that simply puts the cue ball back in position and resets its velocity to zero. And then we just need to call the check pockets function inside the draw loop. Can you improve on my code? I'd love to see your take in the comments. This video is dedicated to my amazing high school computer science teacher, Peter, AKA Wonko the Sane. I vividly remember him helping an older student make something like this around 1996. Ha, that ages me. He inspired me to pursue a career in computers. Thanks, Wonko. Our project is now finished. If you want to learn to code in bite-sized steps, like this video and subscribe. Until next time, happy coding.